This is the fact. The world of the story determines as much of the story as the execution. It is, after all, the foundation on which the story stands. In other words, the world, its politics, cultures, environments, governments, and whatnot determine more of the story than most fantasy writers are willing to admit. For example, take a story like Harry Potter. Throughout the books, Harry faces many challenges and almost all of those challenges stem from the world. Some do stem from within him, as in his character flaws. However, most of the conflict in the story stems from the wizarding world. The Philosopher's Stone, the various wizarding organizations that were put in place to keep wizards safe from muggles. Speaking of muggles, for one, the politics between the wizards and the muggles determines a good chunk of the story. Whether it be a spellcasting fight being navigated around muggles or, in a slightly more creative term, such as the Japanese Swedish players being taught to dodge planes taking off from a nearby muggle airport, or much more drastic ones like Voldemort's Hitler-like desire to wipe out any and all who don't have pure blood. In Lord of the Rings, for example, most of the challenges the Fellowship goes through are ones strictly brought from the world. Hunger Games, yep, you guessed it, most conflict of the story originates from the world. It's literally a survival game. Most of the villains in the Chronicles of Narnia, yep, again, you guessed it, fostered by the world. A good world will result in a better story because if it is a as I said before, well crafted, it will foster obstacles for the characters that force them to encounter their weaknesses as well as be creative, which in turn makes the story that more engaging. Most of our history was actually not determined by people, instead it was people trying to get around obstacles mother nature threw at them. A hill, a river, rocky winds, or angry waves, however we dealt with the obstacles determined our history. This is to say, the world of the story needs to be given more than a wink, and as far as most fantasy stories in this age are concerned it's mostly crap 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 so in this video i want to lay out the four founding principles for building a world that fosters a better story empires need no formulas the first point we have to address in order to build a strategically sound world that fosters natural conflict it's crucial to understand that empires well they kind of don't give a fuck Empires form wherever they want. Most fantasy stories nowadays have empires and kingdoms form only in grasslands and around farms. Of course, there is no denying that a land with grass, warm weather, consistent climate for crop rotation, and plenty of growth will foster more empires and kingdoms than say um, a land only of sand and others of freezing weather. However, the point is that empires and kingdoms, or any governing body that is higher than just tribes, come out from wherever you look. The reason? Well, when an empire or a kingdom is established, it doesn't matter whether its land of origin has resources. An empire's origin is of little importance when it comes to maintaining its relevance. What's more important are the people, their beliefs, and most importantly, the ability to push borders to acquire more territory. In the real world and in most of history, wherever you would have looked, you would have found that people do not give a damn. For ice, you had the Russian Empire that reigned from 1721 until 1917. It was the second largest territorial acquisition, second only to the Mongols. For desert, you had the Umayyad Caliphate, as well as the successor, the Ottoman Empire. And both, might I specify, had the origins in Mecca, a city literally in the heart of Arabia, surrounded by only sand. Later years, the successors, the Ottomans, expanded into Spain. No empire or kingdom has ever inhabited the Antarctic, because the Antarctic is not life-friendly. But Iceland, Russia, Greenland, Canada, parts of the US, Finland, Estonia, Mongolia, and another the 50 countries in the world who have cold weather have all either started empires or have been expanded into by other empires or kingdoms. The reason is because as long as the conditions are slightly, slightly life friendly, as in not freezing to death five minutes after landing on the shore, then you can put forth your ass, people will settle there and there will be a kingdom or an empire. Another example, a very successful fantasy series such as An Emperor in the Ashes is a great example of this problem. Okay, a disclaimer first. I really enjoyed the story and the characters were something of magic. Lovely stuff. That said, the world of this fantasy series is absolutely terrible. There is so much wrong with it, I could make a whole video dissecting it. Anyhow, what's relevant for this particular part is that the environment in the world of the story, um... Well, it's kind of limited. There's grassland over here, and then there's the desert land over here. There is a northern section of the map called the Borderlands that has ice in it. However, the only place where there is an empire or a governing body larger than a tribe is the martial land over here. At the desert lands, there are um, tribes. Yep. 
over here well it's a complete waste first of all this wall hinders its story the writer is good at writing compelling characters and i am amazed how tabasa here has managed to squeeze such a good story out of such a terrible world but that goes to show if she had spent more time building a better world then i'm sure she would have written a story to rival the greats for example in a song of ice and fire the dornish inhabit south of westeros over here which is a complete desert they are one of the seven kingdoms in westeros and have an army strong enough to kill a dragon a mother effing dragon this is what i mean there's honestly very little difference i see in terms of storytelling between sapa and george rr R. martin both are the sort of writers who know this shit more than anyone however george happens to have built a far better world than sapa giving him a leg up there are two ways diversity in the environment can be harnessed to build a strategically smart world. First is by commerce and second is by terrain. Commerce. In the real world, countries produce a certain thing more than other countries. It can be fruits, vegetables, war artillery, or even something concerning entertainment such as movie stars, footballers, or, dare I say it, whores. Canada has lots of maple trees, so it makes sense that they would produce a good chunk of the world's maple syrup. South Africa, Spain, and the US are the top exporters of earth while Russia and Austria are among the top exporters of grain. Brazil and Germany produce the highest number of talented footballers, with France and Argentine tracking just behind. So when it comes to commerce, embrace monopoly and give each one of your ever so unique races or houses something they are better at over the other groups in the world. The Starks in Game of Thrones for example have the highest assortment of honorable fools, while other houses, most notably House Tyrell, have a lush bloom and supply King's Landing with crops and silk and fine wool. This allows for political talking points and carries natural conflict. If it's equality you want, so be it. When House Tyrell stops sending our crops to the capital, everyone here will starve. And I'll make sure the hungry know who's to blame. The basic gist is that the various groups of the people in the world should all have a unique thing to present to the world. Terrain. It's exactly what it sounds like, defendable land. This will result in epic sieges and will force your characters, and in turn you, to think around the barriers blocking the march of your heroes. Let's say a tribe of people live on a mountain. They're minding the business when all of a sudden a group of assholes decide they want to conquer them. This tribe can do either of two things, surrender, which carries risks such as your grills getting used, and your customs getting replaced by that of the invaders. Or, the more logical option, fight and take advantage of your literal high ground. Therefore, this group of people might have predicted someone will eventually come to invade them and they might have set up boulders that are waiting to bumble down and squash anyone climbing just by the clip of a rope. They might have boiling oil too and could turn the enemy real bad. One of the greatest advantages the Romans had in the early humble years was the Alps. And if one was to invade the city of Rome and happen to have a large army stationed anywhere in here, they would have to either land here, which was heavily fortified, obviously, or march through the mountains, which was inhabited by various tribes loyal to the Romans. Think of a maze. Now we sprinkle feminist snakes all over it. Now take this bloke and put him over here. That bloke is Rome. Now take this other bloke and put him over here. That's you. Hannibal of Carthage was a man who found himself in such a case. So a bit of background. It's simplified for the sake of laziness. Anyhow, this guy, Hannibal, was expanding rapidly into Iberia. Over here. The Romans didn't like that, so they used the connections to slow down his eventual march. They were allied to one of the major cities in Iberia, Saguntum, so the Romans trying to stretch the dick all the way here so as to slow down his eventual march to Rome, declared Saguntum the protectorate. An attack on Saguntum meant a declaration of war against Rome. Hannibal considered this an act of decree because the two powers, four years before that fateful day, forged a treaty that split the Iberian Peninsula into two spheres of influence along the Ebro River. This over here was under Carthage influence and this over there was under Roman influence. By stretching the dick all the way into here, they announced war before Hannibal did. So Hannibal, without giving much fucks, smashed Saguntum. And now it was war. Long story short, Hannibal gathered an army of 54,000 soldiers. He marched through the Alps and when he emerged out of it, he only had 38,000 men. The death toll to cross a silly mountain range? Well, more than 10,000. 
The Romans have effectively cut off one of his hands without ever engaging with him. Another famous example is Caesar's invasion of England. He gathered a couple of his legions, built ships and sailed north. The storms struck them of course and most of the ships, once they landed, were in terrible shape. Half of the legions that came with him were forced to return to Gallic territory because the storms were that severe. So his eventual invasion of England was delayed by freaking storms. Think about that for a moment. That's amazing. So yeah, geography matters. The second cornerstone is to spice things up and to alter how warfare is carried out. Sprinkle in some magic or, in the case of sci-fi, exosuits that enhance a soldier's natural abilities, letting them able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. What if there is a super soldier serum or an alchemic mixture of potent nature? Another method is to have your characters pull off a rather exceptional maneuver without spicing things up. The Oblique Order for instance was a brilliant strategical maneuver that was first employed by the Greeks in the Battle of Leuctra. It transformed how ancient Greeks fought in wars and added a spark of genius to what was otherwise a landscape dominated by face-to-face -face engagements. Kings and Generals has made an amazing video and a well-composed one at that, detailing 9 other brilliant groundbreaking strategies. So let's go for a quick recap, strategical depth will make your world better and create natural conflict that doesn't need more than a sentence to explain. There are many ways this can be achieved, but the best way is to plant these seeds into your world. The first way is by having empires come out from anywhere. There doesn't necessarily have to be one empire because I'm goddamn tired of the many many fancy stories with just one goddamn empire. The second way is by commerce and train advantage. Impregnable castles, high grounds, a large supply of a certain fruit, whatever, but it mostly has to do with granting advantages to your various groups. The second is by spicing it up and introducing a fantastical element that changes the understanding of warfare. Aliens, dragons, magical abilities, or even nuclear weapons if the story somehow takes place in World War II. Thanks for watching.